I want to share something with you that the Holy Spirit was putting on my heart this morning when I was coming to church, and I think this is why, because I think it's what we're supposed to look at real quick before we leave. You're very familiar with this. Matthew 28, chapter, 28th chapter, verse 18. Jesus came and he spoke to them, the disciples, and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, pausing for a second, our whole study of Revelation has been about what? That no matter what you read and no matter how scary it looks, all the authority belongs to Jesus. And if you belong to him, you don't need to be afraid. It's just that simple. Say, well, I saw this thing about the mark of the beast, and I saw this thing about the Antichrist, and I saw this thing about the false prophet, and all of them are puppets of an angel fallen that Jesus created that only gets to come and go because he allows it. If you read the end of the book, the entire spiritual darkness that's driven all of this is the dragon. We were learning about him last week. And at the end, it's one angel that wraps a chain around him and throws him in the pit. Okay? So this whole thing where they're screaming at us that the darkness is so big, and some of them are doing it in the name of being Christians and trying to motivate us uh, culturally or, or politically or whatever. We've got to do something. The darkness is prevailing. The devil is a big fat liar. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the light of the world. And the devil is not winning. He's playing his part. And God wrote the script. How you doing? This is off the cuff, fireside chat type stuff. No plan. But when we read that verse and he says, all authority was given to me in heaven and on earth, it doesn't mean there's any left over for anybody else. So the Jesus you were singing to a minute ago and the Jesus we celebrated when we took communion, he's the guy with all authority. Somebody say all authority. That authority is why he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go into all the world and make what? Make what? Father, teach us what disciples are for a couple minutes. This, uh, this left turn is from you, so we're just going to go with you, because when we say this is your church, we're not kidding. So teach us your ways for this time, and let it be finding fertile soil in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a lot of talk around the body of Christ now because we have too many people working for churches that have marketing degrees. And so now everything on every website is buzzwords and catchphrases and everything else. And all that happens when you use a word a lot without it actually being anchored to its meaning is you just cheapen what it means, right? And so if you use the word disciple in the first century, it meant something. If you use the word disciple around American churches now, most people just think it's synonymous with believer. You know, well, yeah, I'm a believer. Are you a disciple? Yeah, sure, I go to church. Are you a disciple? Yeah, I've always believed. Are you a disciple? Yeah, no, I even went to catechism or I went to whatever. I went to the new members class. And that's because that's not what the word disciple means. A disciple is a disciplined follower. Right? Everybody say that with me. Disciplined follower. Now, to help you understand this, we're going to go deep into the Greek. No. We're not, because when we go deep in the Greek, we never get it. We just impress ourselves with our knowledge of Greek, and we leave the same. So I'm going to break this down on a level we can actually understand. Taking your kids to Walmart. You come through the door of Walmart and you tell your little angel package of joy, follow me. Stay right there. And of course they do. Because children are a gift from God. There's been a disconnect somewhere in the gift. Something's wrong on some molecular level with the kiddos. Because you give a perfectly simple instruction like, stay right there. And they go, uh-huh. And you take nine steps. And you hear a crashing behind you. And you turn around. And your angel bundle of joy, cherub gift from God, 
has pulled an entire display of pickle jars over onto the floor. And you know that the little bundle of joy doesn't even like pickles. So there's no logical reason for him to have made that mess except for children are a gift from God. And you get frustrated as a parent. You go, all you had to do was follow me. Just stay right there. Now, this days, of course, you know, bless their hearts. We, we, <laughs> we can't damage their self-esteem. And so we say things like, I can tell you're an entrepreneur. And so deep down, you were trying to arrange the store. And that's good. But, and then that's why they're demonic, because there's no boundaries, right? At, at some point, they still got to learn how to take a swat across the cheek, but that's just my opinion. We know immediately, well, what happened? He didn't follow me. Yeah, so, so this thing of, I'm a disciple, but as soon as Jesus goes, okay, cool, then follow me. And then you go do your own thing all week in the Walmart of life. You charge all over the Walmart of life. You go everywhere. You go down every aisle. And as long as I find him again before Sunday. But that's not being a disciple. Disciples are followers. And that's not just words we put on a website. That's a decision we make. When we get up in the morning, I'm either following him or I'm following me, and there's no middle ground. I'm either following him or I'm following me. Now think about this. Let, let, let's change the analogy, because if I keep picking on kids, somebody will get offended. So let's, let's change it. Let's go the other way. When my wife and I go to a store, when Carrie and I go to Sam's, and I don't understand Sam's, I get overwhelmed at Sam's. I just stand in the doorway like, And I'm not saying she tells me what to do, but, but, but she'll go, just fuck me. And because she knows, she knows if she just says, go get the chips and meet me at the trash bags, there's no chance. Zero. She will find me lost over there in the coffee aisle. There's got to be trash bags around here somewhere. I've been lost in Sam so long, I started asking people for assistance. Like, see an employee go by and be like, excuse me, sir, where's the door? I've been here for three days, and I'm getting parched. She knows, like, we have to stay together, because if we separate even for a second, it's just over. Right? So then how does a, a husband follow his wife through Sam's? Because this is discipleship. Are you learning something? Now see, depending on your background, you go, well, I don't follow my wife anywhere. She follows me. Sure. Um, <clears throat> next week we'll do the thing on lying in church. Okay. Because some of y'all need to be glad it's New Testament instead of Old Testament, or some ground would open under you while I'm talking. Just, whoa! We all know that the man is the head of the house, and then his wife's the neck. We know it's true, so there's no sense in, 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 in arguing about it. The only way for me to follow my wife through the store now, I'm being funny, but I want you to think about this because this is how simple this discipleship piece is and people lose it all the time. The only way for me to follow my wife through the store is to stop worrying about where I want to go and listen to where she wants to go. The only way for you to follow anybody is for you to exchange your priorities for theirs. Are you following what I'm saying? If we walk into Sam's and I go, I want chocolate-covered peanuts, and she says, I want paper plates. Crossroads. 
And the only way for me to follow her through the store is to decide that paper plates. Now, let's dig deeper. Do I want paper plates? <laughs> no. Don't care about them at all. But I know how to follow somebody. We're looking at paper plates. Now, some of you young married guys are moody at the store. You know, like they, they have the cart and they drag along. And they just look real pitiful, you know, like she's making me get paper plates. And when they're young enough, you know how silly it is. Because, look, 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 bro, all she pulled you away from was a video game. So, like, turn that frown upside down. Be glad she wanted you at the store. Because she could have just left you drooling in the car. Like, just, it's fine. You get a little bit older, and you start figuring out, like, it is cool just being at the store with my wife. So this is fine. But the only way for me to follow her is for what she wants to be more important than what I want. Are you following what I'm trying to help you see? You can't follow Jesus until what he wants is more important than what you want. You can't do it. You can't be a disciple telling him about what you want. Because to be a disciple, what you want no longer matters. To be a disciple, you have to get to a place where you are the king of glory and you are the savior that made a way for me, and so now it's just what you want. What do you want today? So, so now, <laughs> can we go a little deeper? How are we doing? We got 10 more minutes. Let's go a little bit deeper. So... In the American church, we came up with something. We were like, okay, wait a minute. People only do what they want. Cool. Discipleship requires not wanting. You got to want what Jesus wants. And woof, that's going to be tough because Americans only do what they want. I know. Let's tell them that what they want is also what God wants. Because then they'll do it. Right? So, 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 so Americans want to have money. I know. Let's tell them God wants them to have money. And then they go, oh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll do this God thing. Americans want to have self-esteem. Let's tell them that that's what God's interested in, is you feeling good. And we just start twisting stuff. And if you sit down with the pastors that do this and you go like, hey, man, I don't want to bum you out, but like, what about that be holy part? And they go, oh, well, we don't talk about that. You know why? Because now you've arrived at something where what people want would actually be in a conflict with what God wants. So we just don't talk about that. So that everybody keeps coming to church and pretending and you must be a disciple because it says so on the website. This is the meeting of the disciples. Okay. Not until what you want is gone. And what Jesus wants is everything. That's when you cross from being a believer to being a disciple. Now please hear me. Do you have to be a disciple to go to heaven? That's always the big question. You're not saying I can't go to heaven. When did we get through that the only goal of Jesus on the cross was to get you to heaven? That's half the lie right there. He's not a retirement program. The goal is not to get you to heaven. The goal is to get heaven in you. The goal is not for you to see the kingdom someday. The goal is for you to walk in the kingdom today. So yes, believing is the beginning, but if you want to get something done for Jesus, you've got to become a disciple. And the only way to be a disciple is to get up and say, today it doesn't matter what I want. It only matters what you want and where you want to go and who you want to talk to and what sacrifice you want me to make. And anybody that comes to you, well, that's crazy. Why would you live like that? You just look at the cross. That's all, that's all I need. It's all I need. I look at the cross. I look at Jesus dying for me. I don't know anybody else in my life who would have done that. So then when he says, let's go this way, it becomes easy to go, yeah. You know, Lord, I don't really want to go that way. I know, but I want to go this way. Are you with me? And then a disciple says, yes. Now, as you do that for a little while, somebody instantly thinks, well, then I'll never get anything I want. Yeah. 
because something else will happen. As you walk with him, you change. And as you change, what you want changes. You know, one of the most misused scriptures, God will give you the desires of your heart. And so then carnal people read that verse and they go, I want a Lamborghini, therefore. I want a big house, therefore. I want to catch the trophy trout of all of Wyoming, therefore. No. No. God will give you the desires of your heart. He starts changing what you want. This is what Philippians was talking about when it said God works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The beginning of it might be I'm doing what I don't want, but the longer I walk with him, I start changing what I want, and pretty soon my desires start lining up with his. I used to have to make myself pray. Then I figure out prayer's working out pretty good. Now I'd rather pray than talk to any of the humans that I know, and I make my way, and pretty soon it's easier to do what God wants because he's changing me and making me like him but I can't even start until I'm willing to look at the why in the road and go Jesus is going this way my flesh wants to go this way and I'm gonna follow Jesus and this has become the lost message in America God wants you to have everything you want that is a lie because most of what we want is short-sighted and carnal and ignorant and temporary. God wants you to want what he wants because then all of a sudden that would be righteous and holy and pure and right and eternal. And the only way that transformation happens is not on YouTube. That transformation doesn't happen driving in your car listening to Caleb. No, that transformation happens one decision at a time. Every time Jesus says, turn left, and your flesh goes, I want to go straight. But man, you want to go left. Ugh. Okay. And with each decision to follow, I change a little bit each time. Have you ever met that wonderfully Christ-like person that it just seems like they got no struggle left in their flesh at all? Like, they're just moving along with Jesus, and you watch them, and you're like, whoa, you're nice all the time. I need help with that. Now, you all wouldn't know that because you think I'm sweet, but honestly, deep down, yesterday morning I got up at the camp, and I, I came upstairs, and, and they had hosted a big breakfast for a, a political group. And so I had done the appropriate thing with that. I had slept through it. And so... I came upstairs when they were leaving, and you know, this is family, man. Clay and Patty are like brothers and sisters, man, not just words. That's true, man. Like, you know, we're like this. And here's one of these yahoos stuff at the camp. Well, I hadn't had coffee yet. <laughs> and I hadn't prayed yet either. So there was a whole lot of old Walt. Not very much redeemed Walt yet. See, some of you roll out of bed, you're just like Jesus. Just <laughs> Some of us got to pray a minute. Put the old man back in the trunk. A whole lot of stuff about you needs to stay in. Like just, you, you, <laughs> come on, you, you don't want all of me coming out. Trust me, you, part of this, I locked it up in there on purpose, and you need to be glad because he's not very nice. I mean, I know some of y'all are perfect, but some of us are in process. And there's some stuff about me that I lock it up on purpose because it's like, no, this is all bad. This is all bad. And, well, that's all I had. I hadn't prayed. I hadn't had coffee. So I walked into the kitchen. I'm pouring my coffee. I'm listening to this. And I'm just instantly like, I just turned to him. I go, so who are you? And he goes, well, I'm, and then she's laughing. Oh, we're talking about the camp. I'm like, uh-huh. Walked away with my coffee, and Roger's sitting out in the thing. He just starts laughing. He's like, dude, I think he wet his pants a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know why he needs to come around here telling us what to do. Take a sip of my coffee, and, and, then, I, and then I realize, because here's all the guys, right? 
They're learning how to follow Jesus. They love me. They watch us on YouTube. I'm practically a superstar up there. And they're all just looking at me. And it was a good life lesson moment. I go, this is what happens when you react to things before you pray and before coffee. So bear with me. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, made a little sign that means nothing to me and went like, <clears throat> took another drink and then smiled. It's going to be all right. And they're just there, you know, pulses racing like, this could be bad. It can be bad. See, some of you are all the way delivered. Some of us are still on our way out. And the fact of the matter is, every one of those decisions is discipleship. Discipleship's not a class you take. You don't become a disciple because you never miss Carrie's Bible class. You become a disciple when you sit in Bible class and learn something, and Monday you do it when everything in you wants to do something else. That's when you become a disciple. Now, understand that when Jesus said, go into all the world and make, he didn't say make church members. He didn't say make tithers. He didn't say go make choir members. He didn't say go make community leaders. And he definitely did not say go make activists. He said, go make disciples who have been taught every single thing I taught you. Wow, Jesus. Way to set the bar like way up here. Because there's supposed to be like junior level Christian stuff and then the big serious stuff only the big serious people do. No, Jesus said, I want every person who says they're my disciple needs to be in the process of learning every single thing I taught you guys. Now time is implied because he walked around with them for three years, day and night. Like, you read the Gospels, they're pretty short, which means most of what happened isn't even in the Bible. Countless conversations over campfires, while out fishing, casting demons out of people and talking them through it. You see how he bucked to the left like that and hit his head on the wall? Next time, stand between him and the wall, like practical. Taught them how to follow him and their decision to do what he wants rather than what they want is what made them be able to say, we are the disciples of Jesus. We go where he wants, and we go do what he wants. I want to encourage you this morning, we are free in Christ. Fourth of July, Independence Day coming up, nobody tells us what to do. Okay? Accept him. Like, you can decide you don't want to do what the British want. Fine. You can decide you don't want to do what Brandon wants. Fine. You can decide that you're not into Trump, you're not into Christie, you're not into Gnome, you're not into DeSantis. You do whatever you want. It doesn't make any difference. Be mad at the Casper City Council. Decide you will not be told what to do by whoever you want. A lot of that's just rebellion. I know it sounds patriotic. Some of it's just an attitude problem, but that's your problem to have. You can do that all you want, but just understand, when Jesus clears his throat, every Christian is supposed to go, yes, and do exactly what he said. Or we shouldn't call him Lord when we pray. If you want some homework, read in the Gospel of Luke, and you will find Jesus finally turning to a crowd and going, why do you keep calling me Lord if you won't do what I say? Lord is not my name. That weird feeling right there, see, that's conviction. That's healthy. That's the Holy Spirit. I know it's absent from a lot of churches now, but it won't hurt you. It's the Lord bearing witness in your own heart that this matters to him. Lord is not his name. Oh, Lord this, Lord that, Lord the other thing. No, no, no. Call him Jesus. That's his name. Show that he's your Lord and how you live. You need somebody else to say, wow, you really have made Christ Lord of your life by how you live, not because you know to say it all the time. Somebody else should be telling you you're radical for Christ rather than you having to tell them. 
because they see it in how you live. So while we're celebrating liberty, brothers and sisters, the whole class in the Bible class right now is all about liberty is not an excuse to walk in the flesh. I'd like to take all the American Christians, if I could get them all in a ball field at one time, and I would just read them that verse. Your liberty in Christ is not an excuse to walk in the flesh. I'm free, so now I do whatever I want. Then you don't understand what your freedom was for. You are set free to serve him, not so you can serve yourself. And the journey of every day of life is Jesus, teach me more completely how to follow you. Because that's what a disciple is. How many want to be disciples? Amen? I don't want to get to heaven and find out that he can't say, well done, good and faithful. Uh Uh-oh. Servant. You only get that admonition if when you get there, when he wanted something, you served him. So let's just make sure. Tuesday is going to be a great day, and we're going to celebrate. And I'm glad to live in America. I'm excited about America. I really am. I don't even let the politics bum me out. It's going to be all right. I watch them all. They all just act crazy. And I'm like, Lord, you're good. It's going to be fine. I mean, it's literally like watching a convening group of orangutans just run around in a circle and fling poop at each other. They're just insane. Like, it makes no sense. I was watching one of their rallies on the TV the other day. They couldn't even decide who to boo. They booed the first guy, booed the second guy, booed the third guy. Other guy got up and said, hey, be nice. They booed him like it was a complete disaster. We look like crazy people. Do you know that there's a comedy station in Australia that's just making fun of how we're acting right now? They have a whole channel, 12 hours a day, what's happening in America today. And a kangaroo goes hopping across the screen, and then they go, now let's talk about where it's really crazy. And all of it is us. Right? Like, we look bad right now, and I am not discouraged. I am not, man. God is good. Jesus is on the throne, and I'm going to keep following Jesus every single day. And when this is all wrapped up, we are going to be standing exactly where he wanted us to be because all the authority on heaven and earth is his. And they can do what they want, act crazy if they want. We just got to be those quiet people in the corner that smile and say, bless your heart a lot. Bless your heart. Wow. I'm going to follow him. Amen? That's discipleship. And I don't know why that mattered this morning, but sometimes when I tell the Lord, let's do whatever you want, sometimes he gives me a left turn. I had a whole nine-page thing about the false prophet and the mark of the beast and all that fun stuff. Next week, somebody needed just a reminder, and maybe it's me. Maybe somebody 